All right, good evening, and thank you for joining us as we tackle mental health and aviation, putting your mask on first. Uh, tonight, I'm joined by a panel of individuals representing the University Counseling Center, UND Student Health, as well as our Student Aviation Advisory Council to talk about this important issue. Uh, we also have with us uh, a uh, UND alum from 2016 Aviation Management, Vanya Voskarinsky, who is going to be sharing his story and perseverance through his mental health uh, issues as he transitioned to UND. Uh, before we get started with Vanya's story, I am going to kick it over to Mr. Brian Willis, our Director of Aviation Safety. Brian. Thanks, Beth. Um, as, as Beth mentioned, my name is Brian Willis, Director of Aviation Safety. And first and foremost, I'd like to welcome everybody um, that, that's joining this webinar, or even if you're watching this two, three days from now, uh, for taking the time uh, to, to, to look at this uh, video and, and kind of take a look back uh, as, as to the importance of mental health in, we'll say aerospace, but I think you could tie this into any industry. Um, and, and, and I think that's really important to understand is, is that this is an aerospace centric, but if you happen to come across this video, non-aerospace related, mental health is, is huge in, in everything that we do um, with it within humanity. So uh, what the intent of this is coming out of safety week, one of the ideas that we had is I'm sure there were questions, comments that may be spurned up from our quick seven or eight minute conversation. And so this webinar is really that opportunity that maybe when you saw the video of, of Dr. Christensen or Dr. Solom and a question popped in your head, this is, this is that opportunity to ask that anonymous question and, and get that direct feedback but more importantly, I think it's going to be the, the conversation that Vanya has, which is a real story of, of, of somebody who, you know, went through the aerospace process, the medical process, and the hoops it took to get to where he was, and not only jump through the hoops, but to end out on the other side, very successful. And if there's one thing that you take away, I think, from today's conversation, it's the early conversation and knowing that UND Aerospace, UND, and I'll say um, uh, humanity as a whole has a uh, process and there's plenty of areas that you can reach out to for assistance to get through those hoops. So with that, I am gonna turn it right over to Vanya um, to, to walk through a scenario. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and Go ahead and just interrupt me if at any point something does go wrong or I forget to unmute myself. But thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Again, my name is Vanya. It rhymes with lasagna. And I am a safety management system consultant at Southwest Airlines for flight operations. So I support our pilot group. You are all familiar with SMS because it's your first briefing of your uh, every, um, at the start of every uh, course, um, flight course at UND. So that, that's what I do for a living. Um, and I graduated UND uh, in 2016, like uh, Professor Birke said in uh, aviation management. Before that, I was at Mounds U High School. And a day in the life of Banya at Mounds U High School looks a little bit something like this. It started with a 5 a.m. meet at school because I was not the best student. Um, I uh, To graduate, I had the pressure uh, and the necessity to meet my meet my teachers at the time uh, and get private tutoring lessons with them so I can just get my grades up in order to graduate and also um, pre uh, uh, before school activities like orchestra. Uh, then I did my PSEO classes, had my high school classes. Um, after school, I had uh, organized a Gay Straight Alliance, uh, which had over 140 people. And if you are organizing a club and you want people to come, I know Paul knows this, the best way to get people to come is by giving them free food. And so we do, uh, I was picking up uh, snacks on my way to school early in the morning. Um, I was also in theater, um, but that was done behind my parents' back because theater made me gay. And so that kind of summarizes my relationship with my parents. And uh, after that, I uh, drove the carpool, which I organized to the Minnesota Boy Choir in the activity that I absolutely loved um, and I'm very passionate about. And, uh, and then go home. So I was out of the house from about 4.30 in the morning till about 10 o'clock p.m., which I'm sure is pretty typical for every high school student, but definitely a lot more familiar with uh, college students. Uh, definitely was my experience in college. My uh, college uh, schedule looks something like this. Um, you know, for those that are working full-time jobs, 
we're our job is learning right during the school day so you're either working very early in the morning or very late at night um so I, my shift started at 3 30 in the morning where i was working um i still want to be involved with the community so i you know if there was a career fair i'd make sure that i go get to that um i would go to my courses and then of course there's the flying that's involved but looking at that you're out of the house from 3 a.m to 9 p.m and uh, again doing what i love to do it's helping others it's being involved it's um uh, doing my job, which I absolutely love, but there's no time for me to take care of myself. And because of that, you know, I had this uh, energy to keep moving forward and have a fast life uh, because I felt if I was slowing down, I would be stalling. And if I wasn't focused on someone else, then I would be selfish because I'm not using my time to take care of anyone else. Those things would mask my uh, increasing suicidal ideation, just thoughts that I became comfortable with and uh, got to the point that it actually grounded me from flying at UMD. There's a little video that we're about to show that um, will share my story. Beth? Everyone. And that's something that um, my counselor helped me realize is that maybe it's not suicide that I was looking for, but it was to step away and just kind of disappear. In high school, I uh, came out to my family as gay. Uh, my father's a missionary, and so he travels to Russia a lot, um, and he... Uh, is a public figure there, so he's recognizable. And so with that, um, can't really have a gay son. Uh, they definitely weren't supportive in the sense of like, he, okay, let's you know accept that. It was a lot of like, what can we do to fix you? Essentially uh, got to the point that I just didn't talk about it and it was kind of shoved under the carpet. And so um, I started separating my lives of my life at home and then outside of my home, like, in my school setting, I would be another figure of myself. And it really helped me. I had a couple names. Uh, I go by Vanya, I go by John. On my driver's license, it says Ivan. I did get bullied after it. I just asked out a straight guy because I was like, well, that should be part of normal life, right? Their reaction was, let's go beat me up. I just recognized that I needed to change the, um, the culture in the school. And so I started Gay Straight Alliance um, the next week. Um, and it was kind of like a fulfilling process of I could go up to that classroom where that kid and the other kids were that beat me up and confidently stand up. I was like, hey, I'm starting the Gay Straight Alliance where people can have difficult conversations, where people can come together. From an organization of three, it grew to an organization of 148 students. It wasn't until my senior year after a trip with my family to Israel, which is my, you know, my father's work, and I had a great time with my family. We genuinely loved each other. Um, and when I came back and I had to go back to that separation of lives, it, I essentially broke down. I figured that if I just keep moving, um, then I'll, I'll get over it. I can you know, push those difficult things away. And I remember one night I did drive down to the airport and I uh, watched planes and watched a movie about a gay kid who killed himself and kind of what his family went through. So all of that kind of got me into suicidal ideation. And I called my friend and kind of told her what was going on. And she made me promise her that I will seek help that I won't do anything tonight. Um, so waited until late in the night, drove home, woke up the next morning and drove to my doctor's office and just came up to the front desk and said, I need help. And so saw their psychiatrist. I was thankfully 18, so I was able to get financial help so I could um, pay for those things without my parents knowing, without insurance. Got medication, um, took it again, hiding it from my folks. Um, went every week. Um, first it was three times a week and then it was kind of every week because we didn't know how severe um, I was. And then I wanted to start flying planes with UND. 
and I couldn't get my medical because I was under medication and the FAA didn't really know what to do. And then in the end, they came to the conclusion of you can have your medical, you can fly planes, but you need to see someone um, every two weeks. So I go to the counseling center. For those that feel that they are depressed, for those that know that they're going through some hard times, they need to go to someone that recognizes it. Um, going to a friend who's not going to be supportive, unfortunately, is going to get you more depressed because you're not going to get that support. Um, hopefully, you have those friends that will listen, that will try. But without them knowing what you're going through or without them being professionals, they might not be able to be the best resource for you. They are there to be your friend and to support you. And they are the ones that are going to say, hey, I might not be the best one to go to. I hear you. I am trying to understand. But let's go together to get you some help. Let's go to the counseling center together. That's exactly what my friend did with me. In the aviation program, we're taught that we have like dangerous attitudes, whether you're being macho and you think that like you're better than everyone else or impulsivity or invulnerability that like, hey, I might have depression, but it's not going to affect me. Like, that's not me. I'm going to be good. Um, those are those hazardous attitudes. Am I invulnerable or am I being too macho right now? Um, and how can I set myself up for success? by getting attention. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be a dramatic big story. Like if, if you feel that way, then if you're thinking about it, you gotta seek help. Um, we got past the point of my high school life and um, my relationship with my family. So I'm at the point now where I can go back to my family and have loving conversations and talk to each other. Um, genuinely be myself. I don't need to separate those lives anymore. Um, I, can, uh, I can just be called different names like Vanya and John, but the person's going to be the same. Uh, overall, this experience, I'm glad I had it. I'm glad I got help. My name is Vanya, and I have no shame. Thank you. So... There, there, there's my story. So with that, um, the, the, the parts that uh, I think every, everyone has questions about, and really in the aviation community, whenever we recognize and we start talking about depression and we are afraid to um, go and share that with our friends, um, we're, we're afraid of snitches, we're afraid uh, of this, um, uh, some sort of pressure uh, that we, we can't be imperfect. Um, or, and so I, I recognize that, you know, I, I had to go um, and uh, my, my friend made sure that that night when I was had a plan um, that I, I, I promised her one night and, and the next day I I'll, it, it was going to my doctor's office and just checking at the front desk and saying, I, I need help. Um, with that, because of the medication, the initial uh, application to the uh, to get my medical was denied, um, but with some back and forth, and I wouldn't be able to do that back and forth alone. It was a lot of great resources with uh, UND uh, and the Counseling Center and Doc Jensen at the time as well, um, who helped facilitate that process. So no one's asking anyone to do this alone. Um, it's it's why we're why we're all together, why there's so many people on this uh, panel um, to offer our help and support to say, what can we do for you to pursue your dreams? I think it's really exciting that the FAA, rather than saying, no, you can't fly at all, just get better and get back to us, uh, rather encouraged me to become my best self. And that is by getting help, by getting treatment, by going to the counseling center um, and recognizing the FAA said, you aren't perfect, but you can fly as long as you keep working on it. And that's the opportunity that really motivated me to um to, to be, be comfortable with counseling um, and, and getting started with UND Counseling Center. And through all four years, um, I, I went to the Counseling Center every two weeks um, and, and, and got to meet some, some great people in there, got to learn all of the, uh, not all, <laughs> but a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of uh, tips and tricks that helped me. So one of those things, you know, we, I, I clearly, um, I kind of have a skill for time management. I'm able to fit in a lot of my day. But the, one of the first things that the counselor asked me is, when do you eat? 
And that was it. That threw me off because uh, usually, you know, I was expecting like, what makes you sad and what makes you happy? You know, just be happier, you know, so um, they're, they're, they're good at what they do. Um, and so, and they threw me off by asking, you know, when do you eat? And when you eat, is it healthy? You know? And so we kind of looked at my high school schedule and figured out, well, no, absolutely not. So I was going on kind of a survival mode, my body physically, one of those seven elements of your health and wellness, your physical health. Um, I wasn't, you know, investing in that. Um, same thing with, you know, if I wasn't sleeping, if I was out of the house all day, then I was, uh, and I had a high workload, not much rest period, um, then I could easily be fatigued. You'll notice that inadequate health and fitness levels, if we're all cooped up at home and we don't go and take care of ourselves, or if we drink alcohol, then that can lead to fatigue, especially if they're all working together. And it impacts our relationships. We know that it impacts our health, but what we don't forget, uh, what we often forget is that it it, there's a long-term thing like our well-being. And as a pilot, uh, we need to recognize that there are consequences to fatigue, and that is impaired problem solving. That's the altered perception of risk. I work in safety, so I, I care so much about risk management and what a pilot decides to do when they're given, uh, a, a, when they're limited with the options that are ahead of them. Same thing with a negative mood, even being crabby. And for any CFIs that are watching this, recognize that if your student usually is it has a great personality, but then they, you know, if there's a reduction in participation and they have a negative mood, it's not always because they just had a bad day. It could be fatigue. And then we can kind of probe uh, each other with those questions as well. And I do want to recognize one more time that, you know, alcohol is definitely one of those uh, leaders uh, that go there, that gets you in that state. Same thing with cumulative fatigue, recognizing that not everyone uh, needs 18 hours of sleep every single night, um, but six hours of sleep is probably good, maybe one night or two nights. But as if you are consistently going on six hours of sleep, your effectiveness is going to continue to decrease. And when you say that, hey, you know, three, I, I constantly have uh, six hours of sleep and you're at 80% effectiveness, you're not just getting used to six hours of sleep, you're actually getting used to being 80% effective. And why not be your best self? Isn't that exciting? Isn't that what we want to be? If you're a B, constant B student, is it because you're at your 80% effectiveness? And if you set yourself up with your physical health and these different um, elements of health and wellness, then you can be at 100% and you can take care of one another. Um, with that, uh, I definitely don't go through the seven health and wellness uh, elements of health and wellness and kind of put that in my schedule, but I do know that if ever I feel off kilter and one of those elements is missing, uh, then, or, or then I can go back and kind of figure out what am I missing? What am I focusing on to, or what am I forgetting? The biggest takeaway that I do want to share is that counseling does set you up um, to get you to your best self um, at, at that point in time in your life. And when self-help, uh, and they teach you these self-help measures, stuff that I carry uh, with me today. Um, and I do recognize that when that's not enough, I'm not going to be able to get myself there. And I need to seek professional help. And whether I do that by going up to the office and asking for that, or I reach out to a friend. So recognizing to all the friends that are listening, if you hear that from someone, know that your role is that of a friend not of the professional um, counselor. So go with them to the counseling center, get them the help that they need because you uh, definitely want to support them there. I do know that we want to go and open up the panel for discussion, but just want to give you a couple examples of those um, seven elements of health and wellness, uh, starting with spiritual, and that's living by your principles. For me, I recognize that the most important thing to me, and that's what troubled me in, in during my episodes was honesty. I was not honest. I was very much living different lives because I was um, separating uh, lives by different names. Um, with that, my strongest principle is honesty, and that's something I hold myself to uh, very strongly. Um, cultivating healthy relationships and recognizing that um, your uh, that emotions are energy, and if you keep them cooped up, it's just going to continue to go and go until it blows up, right? But at the same time, emotions are energy. And so if you're sharing negative energy because you're surrounding yourself by folks that don't challenge you to be your best self, well, then you're, you're just spreading negative energy around. 
around. So really surround yourself by folks that you can aspire to grow to and, and continue to challenge yourself socially there. Occupational, easy for me because I love what I do. And therefore, I don't work a day in my life. I, I hope we're all passionate about aviation and you're doing the same. And you're able to um, after UND as well. Uh, learning time management skills when it comes to environmental. It's not just, you know, separating your colors for plastic and recycling, but um, at the, it's uh, living effectively. And are you using your time effectively? For me, that's time management and making sure that every, maybe not minute, but every activity that I do um, is worthwhile and has a goal and I'm not uh, slumping around. Um, intellectual, being curious and open-minded. Um, by going to school, you know, as working uh, outside of uh, a educational environment, um, working for an airline, I still learn new things every single day, and I still go to courses and continue to aspire and grow. So um, we need to make sure that we we challenge ourselves with that. Emotional is a very big one, uh, but in recognizing that's that's just one of the seven elements, and so. If you just focus on emotional the whole time, you might be forgetting some of the other ones. Um, accept and forgive yourself, cultivating an optimistic attitude. Again, recognizing that attitudes are contagious and it's that energy that goes around. Seeking and providing support. Um, my little thought with that is if you're using, uh, you know, when you don't know something and you know that Google has the answer, you go to Google. So if you know something is uh, with your mental health needs attention, you don't go to Google, you, you go to the counseling center because that's where the answers are, right? Um, so go seek help in, in the places that are offering it. Being attentive with your thoughts and feelings and not letting them creep up on you um, and really having those uh, social friends that you can reach out to and, and be vulnerable, um, share things uh, that, you, that you might not usually do. And again, when these self-help measures aren't enough, then seeking professional help to carry you over. With that, that's my story, and uh, and uh, I know there's a couple questions uh, that I want to make sure that we all get to answer. But um, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Vanya, for sharing your story with us. So uh, again, we do want to leave time now for questions and answers from our audience. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q and A button there. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask, and we're going to introduce our panel here very shortly, uh, feel free to type those in. We do have it opened up so you can ask your questions anonymously. Uh, Paul is going to help moderate the questions with our panelists. But before we get started, again, put your questions in there. Uh, let's go around and introduce the rest of the panelists uh, that we haven't heard from yet. So Dr. Solom, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. What a privilege. Uh, and thank you, Vanya, for sharing your experience, strength, and, and, and hope message there. Um, very powerful. And uh, I've been director of the Council Center now for about three years and uh, just look forward to any questions uh, in the mental health uh, uh, that you may have. And I've had the privilege to work with students on campus for a little over nine years now. So Thanks. I'll pass from there. All right, Dr. Christensen. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Christensen. I work at the Student Health Center. I've been there over 20 years, and I've been doing flight physicals for roughly 20 years plus uh, myself. Um, myself and Dr. Heinle are the two AMEs that work there. Uh, between the two of us, we do about eight to 900 flight physicals every year. Uh, we see all uh, students, obviously, and also private pay. So we've had people that have been coming back to see one of us or Dr. Swenson before us for 30 some years. So. Uh, just know that when you graduate from UND and move on to bigger and better things, you're always welcome to come back and get your flight physical done, uh, hopefully where you started. Thanks. And Paul. Hi there. My name is Paul Kwame. Uh, among other things, I'm the vice president of SAC, and uh, I'm uh, really uh, happy that uh, we are having this discussion. Uh, and thank you so much to Vanya uh, for, for sharing your story. Um, like Beth mentioned, we, we do have an open Q&A uh, 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 opportunity at this time. Um, you can I've, uh, definitely click that anonymous button. You can ask anything you want anonymously. Um, we are also going, to, um, going to, to, to do it on the back end here so that none of your, your questions are made uh, public. Um, this uh, Q&A will, um, uh, will be recorded, uh, and so we'll have... Uh, uh, these questions and answers available later uh, for, for later reference. Uh, Vanya, I just wanted to ask you just to start off um, with your story, 
how, what was sort of the timeline there, you know, from you applying and getting denied and then being told you're allowed to fly again? How long did that take? And are there any lasting uh, repercussions? Absolutely. Great question. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my uh, first episode, uh, suicidal episode, was in my senior year of high school. And uh, it, it was about the spring uh, spring of my senior year, so in near the end there. And uh, then I was getting ready to come to UND. You know, we all know that packet with a little checklist of things that we need to do. Um, and during the summer, I applied uh, for my medical. With that, I was on my medication for about four or five months already. Uh, and uh, immediately I, I, I was denied and um, st started going through the process. I think it took about uh, maybe a semester of corn. Uh, well, no, not a full semester. It took two months to coordinate with UND and back and forth with the FAA of just packets and figuring out, you know, the um, and visiting different psychiatrists, recognizing at what level my uh, uh, depression and treatment needed to be, um, and uh, and would I pose a risk to myself or others if if I do um, continue flying by the end of the of my freshman year of, uh, at UND, I, uh, got my, actually, I started flying my uh, second semester of freshman year at UND. So I was able to get a limited certificate where it's a one year, um, uh, well, uh, with the condition that I would be, uh, seeking treatment once every two weeks by the time, uh, so four years later, by the time I was a senior, um, I uh, was able to uh, complete the application again, more back and forth with the FAA with the help of the resources at UND. Um, and I actually, I, I was very excited. It was, it was a, my big, you know, cherry or birthday cake or whatever at the end was the fact that I have a, uh, I, and I forgot the term, but um, uh, Dr. Christensen, you know it, but it's a, an unconditional- Special issuance? No, no, no. I got the unconditional, um, uh, certificate where, where there were no limitations. Um, and I was good for the four or five years. So th that was very exciting for me to know that, you know, the FA trust me in long term, and they know that if I need to go back, I will go back and I can get a special uh, issuance again. So now I have no restrictions on my medical. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Christensen, uh, I know, uh, the, oh, I think I'm frozen. Hang on here. Well, Paul figures out his technology. Perhaps I'll take one of the questions that just came in on the Q&A. Uh, so Dr. Christensen, I think this one is for you. Can pilots have ADHD and be medicated for it without making them ineligible for their medical license? Um, that, that is a great question. Uh, and we deal with that every day. Uh, it, it's kind of a complex uh, question that I, I'll try and answer as best I can in the time we have here. Um, so what happens sometimes with ADHD in particular uh, you're five, six, seven years old, your parents bring you to the doctor and they say, my kid is hyper and I think he's got ADHD. And the doctor says, yep, he looks like he's got ADHD and they put him on medication. Um, it's becoming less and less likely that you, you get tested. Uh, we are getting better with the testing now, but in the past, oftentimes you would just get put on Ritalin, Adderall and say, yep, this is going to help with their ADHD quote. Uh, and you take it for five, six, seven years, sometimes through high school, and then all of a sudden, well, maybe you don't need to take it. So we've had, we've had students that will present that way that they have a history of ADHD that they really weren't officially diagnosed as being having ADHD. They were treated for it, but they actually did not have the history. So the first thing to figure out is whether they actually do have an actual diagnosis of ADHD. Um, sometimes if they're actively taking Adderall, Ritalin when they come to school, um, the, the FAA would like to have them tested uh, and they want to make sure they're not taking any kind of a stimulant. So they have to do a drug test prior to uh, taking the, the test and they run you through the whole battery of tests to see if you have uh, potentially the diagnosis of ADHD. So long story short, I mean, if you technically have the diagnosis of ADHD on medication, that is disqualifying for flying, but we have worked around that and oftentimes through testing doing the strict test for ADHD, students have been able to get their medical and they have been able to succeed in their flying career. Thanks, Paul, oh, back to you. Yes, I'm so sorry, I froze at an inopportune time, it happens. 
Um, I want to bring in uh, uh, Tom Solom. I know we, we, are, we do have a lot of questions for, for Dr. Christensen, and we'll try to address all of those. Um, Tom, would you just tell us, I know Vanya mentioned uh, how much it helped him to, to physically go into the counseling center. Mm-hmm. I know that, you know, there's some, some struggles with that right now. Um, what are the services that you're op- offering right now? And um, if it's not in person walking in somewhere, how can, how can a student uh, get access to those? Yeah, so nothing like a counselor to try to be synthesized and concise in a recording here. So I will, I will work to answer that here uh, um, as, as synthesized as I can. So basically right now we, we are adhering to telemental health um, in, in terms of safety and, and areas. With that being said, all of our uh, trained licensed clinicians, um, except for the few that have been recently hired, are board certified telemental health clinicians. Um, ready to, to serve and offer telemental health sessions via this platform. Um, now things are getting a little more um, in the arena where people are uh, requesting different uh, uh, sessions or meetings and we're having them work with our case manager to, uh, to figure out what each student is looking for so we can best accommodate. So um, long story short, in that sense, students are, are predominantly still using our telemental health platform. Um, in enjoying it uh, and and very, very few glitches in in the process. We also have uh, ability, if you don't want to pick up the phone and call 2127-777-2127, you can schedule your first appointment online on our webpage. So you can make that first initial appointment, um, no barriers, you you fill in a little bit of information and you can pick your counselor and time and space and you'll have that secured for you uh, if you'd like to go that route as well. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Christensen, we're, uh, we're, ah, oh, there we go. Dang it. Okay. Uh, sorry, I thought I froze again. Uh, Dr. Christensen, I know there's, there's quite a few, um, you know, people who are concerned about really the two big ones, uh, particularly on a college campus is going to be depression and anxiety. Could you just touch briefly on both of those and sort of what the process is? Is it any different than what you already uh, described? And um, and, and maybe share some success stories or two from, from helping people out with that. Sure. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's hard to delineate between depression and anxiety. We sometimes in medical, we kind of throw them both together and uh, they're, they're sometimes treated with the exact same medications, the SSRIs, which have been approved <clears throat> by the FAA to, uh, to fly with. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so uh, to be honest, um, there probably not is a huge differentiation between the two, um, depending on how it's treated, whether it's through medication and or uh, counseling, we, we sometimes go along the same path. And in, in fact, one of the, uh, the uh, deciders for uh, the FAA issuing uh, a, a medical is that if you're taking an SSRI for any reason other than depression, uh, that that's okay. And there's five of them that are okay to take. Um, and if you're using it to treat anxiety, it can, it can be, uh, covered for that as well as an adjustment disorder, um, and things like that. So, um, you know, Vani kind of touched on a couple things with, um, having to go back every couple of weeks to do the counseling and having a special issuance over, uh, several years. And, you know, we, we use the term hoops to jump through, and I don't mean to make it sound, uh, to belittle it. And then it, it's sometimes significant hoops to jump through. And, and the fact that you really want to do it, uh, you can get it done. Uh, and the, the light at the end of the tunnel, like Vani kind of alluded to is, you know, the first several years, generally four or five years after you get approved, they they monitor you very closely. So you basically have to time limited uh, medical that usually is every 12 months. So you end up coming back every 12 months you need to get reports from your treating physician and or psychologist. Um, so you're followed very closely for the first four or five years. And then if everything goes well, generally, they kind of let you go, uh, so to speak. And you don't have to keep having the special issuance done every single year. Um, and you can go back to the regular schedule of, of you know, whether first, second or third class uh, for your appropriate age. So if there's a success story, it's that if you can jump through the hoops and get through it and do what you need to do, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, like Vanya talked about, and you don't have to keep doing that the rest of your life. And you can kind of keep moving on and, and get to your regular medical. Uh, 
And Vanya has his hand up, so I think he has something to add here. Thanks. I, I just want to provide the perception of, you know, go, going through the process um, uh, and, and reading some of the questions that are coming in. And I definitely have this as well, and I have friends brought it up, but the perception of, you know, you're coming in to seek help and then you're, you're afraid that someone's got a net, they take you and you're done, you know, you're, you're out of there and then they've caught you and you're, you, um, just know that if you're having that, if you're, if you're seeking help, people want to help you. And so no one wants to stop you from doing what you want to do, right? Um, they, they encourage you to come in. I'm probably going to get a smack on the hand from Dr. Christensen and Dr. Sloan. But, um, but, but my perception was, if I'm not a danger to myself, and if I'm not in, uh, putting others in danger, then I get to go back to my dorm. I get to sleep in my own bed. And I get to live my life the same I did yesterday, but the same way I will tomorrow. So uh, a couple of questions of, is it going to be sprung up on you if there's a diagnosis? Is someone going to catch you and take you away? And the answer to that is, if you're a danger to yourself, yes. But why wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want that for your friends? If they are to hurt themselves today, won't you want them to get the help that they needed? And it, I would imagine if you're on this call today, you're not, you're not there yet. And, and, and hopefully you won't be. And so therefore you just need uh, perhaps to start that conversation and, and we'll guide you there. Yes, there are hoops, but hey, we've been remote for over about a year now. That's a really long year. And we're gonna, you know, and, and that's, so, that's the, you know, the paperwork that you send to the FAA, my, it sounds very official, but it was just like a little form of, hey, can we print this all out? And then I put it in the mail and then I get my medical for another year. So it, uh, it may seem very official, but it was very casual because I knew I did exactly what they wanted. And I continued my treatment and everything's okay. And I'm going on the right path. So it is very formal. They want to take care of you, but it, it, I, no one's going to you know, snatch you away. Um, I'm wondering if Tom, uh, you can possibly add to this. Um, you know, there was a question, uh, does the counseling center diagnose patients? I think there may be a perception or a fear among quite a few people that if you go into that counseling appointment, you're going to walk away with a diagnosis and a prescription. Mm. And I wonder if you could maybe address. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one might take a, take a little bit. So I'll, yeah, the prescribing leaves to, to Dr. Christensen. We don't prescribe. Um, and um, so there, there's a couple things to unpack here, I think. And the first one is, we on the counseling center team staff were really sensitive to um, individuals coming into care, mental health care, emotional well being, whatever you want to call it, for sometimes the first time in their life. Sometimes the first time of starting to talk about where they're at, what they're going through. And we're really sensitive to understanding that. Um, um, moving and adjusting and shifting arenas and, 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 and career choices can bring stress, right? So we, we tend to um, really, again, be um, understanding of how we work with people, how students are experiencing their stressors, and put them in context to how to, how to put gaps in there, how to put emotional, well, as Vanya talked about in there, of sometimes just taking a step back and looking at some subtle shifts, some subtle moves of, of eating better or, or going for a walk and taking care of self and management. So from those beginning pieces, you know, a lot of times students come in, they see us for a few sessions and, and we, don't, we don't have a, a, a diagnosis that, that goes along. With that being said, um, we do, I, it is important to be transparent that we do diagnose. We are mental health professionals and we do diagnose and we recognize mental health challenges um, uh, when, when caught and, and, and understood and slowed down with, um, uh, with understanding and sort of self-discovery and, and that you heard early on. It, it starts to um, um, give, give light for people. It starts to uh, acknowledge that what they've been carrying maybe for uh, a, an extended period of time in their life can now kind of be talked about, can, can, can be unpacked in a, in a confidential setting um, is really important. And then when that, if that starts to happen, when we talk about diagnoses that we know we're sensitive to that can um, have further conversation, we that's where the team becomes important. That's where we talk with Dr. 
Christensen down at Student Health, and we let them know we have a partnership. We let them know I can't speak all the same language that you're going to be looking here, but we can tell you that you're not going to have to do this alone. We can tell you that we have mechanisms set up because your well-being matters. And if, if we can slow it down a little bit, uh, as Vanya said, when you're, if safety's at risk, like your primary thing there is we want you to be well. We want you to be safe. So again, I think there's two sides of it that we're sensitive to and attentive to. And when we need a team, we have it. When it needs further, they don't have to have to be alone to go through that. Um, so again, I, I think it, 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 it really does depend in situations and circumstances. We take that very seriously as professionals on our campus. And um, we do, we work really hard to understand the aviation part, but also we know when, when to include the, the, the doctors at student health to also assist us along the way so people aren't alone. And if Tom, if I just saw a question come in, if you would answer really quickly, how does yeah. billing work uh, for the counseling center? Do you guys charge for those services? Yeah, no, no, you were, we're covered under your student fees. So um, we don't bill, we don't work with insurance, we're covered under your student fees. Um, so there are zero barriers there for you in terms of mental health care. Yeah. <laughs> I see Vanya clapping. Yeah, no, I think that's a great resource that we have here. Um, Dr. Christensen, sort of, um, you know, uh, moving forward from that, after that initial counseling appointment, um, I saw somebody ask, um, if I seek counseling, do I have to report it to the FAA? And if so, uh, will I be grounded? So I think that speaks to both, you know, what do I have to report on MedExpress and what don't I have to report? And then what is even possible address both? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and, and we deal with that every day. And, and like Tom just alluded to, uh, if you have any questions at any point, you can call uh, student health and talk to either a nurse or, or myself or Dr. Heinle and or even make an appointment to see one of us at any time to talk about any of this stuff. And, and someone asked, is, is your medical going to be snatched away if you come in and talk about something like that? Definitely not. Um, when you talk about reporting, what needs to be reported versus, you know, it, it's sometimes goes back on the airmen. You know, there's some days where you may have a sinus infection, uh, bronchitis, whatever, and you know you shouldn't be flying. You don't fly. You don't need to report that. Um, there are other situations where you hurt your ankle. You possibly get some pain medication. You're taking that for a couple of days. Obviously, you should not be flying at that point. There are more serious situations where someone has a heart attack. Uh, someone has a stroke. Someone has some type of cancer. Those are obviously a little bit different scenarios where if something like that happens, that does need to be reported to the FAA. And if you're thinking in your head, you know, should this be reported or not? Sometimes it's best just to err on the side of, of reporting it and then figuring out whether it needed to or not. So there, there's no downside to calling and talking to one of us about that or even coming in and seeing us. Um, the, when I, like I alluded to, if you come in and talk about something, uh, depression or anxiety wise, you know, you, we're, you're covered with HIPAA. We cannot just call and say something unless you're like Vanya alluded to, you're a, a threat to yourself or someone else. Then yes, you definitely need help that needs to be taken care of. And then we'll figure out how to go from there. But for the, for the person who comes in and has some questions or some concerns about depression and or anxiety and wants to talk with one of us, it's going to be confidential. It's going to be held at all just between you and whoever you're talking to. And there's no threat to be losing your medical because of that. Thank you so much. Um, Brian, I want to bring you into this also. I saw a really great question here. Um, does the university have any stakeholders in breaking down barriers to getting mental health and help and visibility within the aviation program? What can we do to make mental health less intimidating? And I I also want to kind of expand that, um, you know, something that I think about quite a bit is that a lot of the people uh, who I'm going to school with and who may be listening now, you know, in 20, 30, 40 years, they're going to be, uh, you know, in charge of airlines and high up in the FAA and, you know, working here at UND. Um, so what is, what's some, you know, what are the big organizational things that we can do both here and abroad to, to help this? That's a great question. Um, and I think when you look at where, uh, we are at organizationally, the ultimate goal is trying to build those relationships. Uh, there's been a counseling center since I was a student. Um, however, 
the understanding of what services are out there and creating awareness as both Dr. Solomon and Dr. Christensen have already talked about, that's where you into aerospace is, is trying to take that next step is, is try to create this awareness that the services are here within the school already. And to, to see that the organization is supporting the counseling center and student health and the, and it comes, it flows right back the other direction. I can't tell you how many times I called Dr. Christian Cern or I've talked to Dr. Solom about certain scenarios. It's opening up those relationships. Um, not only I'll say at the admin level, but then also through these awareness uh, last week, safety week, having that video done for mental health. We had another, another one done earlier in the fall. Um, and then obviously this session here, when I think back as a student, I don't know that those things really existed 20 years ago. Uh, and so really it's creating those awareness. And another, another thing that we're working on, I've been working with closely with Dr. Solom is um, having a connection with the counseling center. So I know within our aviation safety class, and then also one of our upper level uh, safety management classes, we have uh, Dr. Sloan from the counseling center coming in to provide that face to talk about mental health and, and what are some little things that you could just do in your free time um, to, to, to better yourself. And, and those techniques are really being uh, brought to the forefront to try to um, catch it early, A, or it gives you ways that you can sit back if, if you feel yourself that you're getting strained or, or stressed, that you're able to maybe, uh, I'm not gonna say self-diagnose, but there's, there's tactics that you can use yourself. And if it gets to the point that you need to seek help, that you know that direct connection. And, and again, having Dr. Solom here and Dr. Christensen to me is huge from a stakeholder standpoint because it puts a face to the department. It puts a face to student health. It puts a face to the counseling center. And sometimes, and, and again, I can't speak for Vanya, but sometimes that face is all it takes um, to break that comfortability barrier that when you go in, you're talking to a stranger, but it's really not a stranger because they've been part of that process before. And so to me, I think that's where UND, we're not there, UND Airspace, we're not there yet, but that is something that I'm sure we're going to do and we're going to continue to do uh, for the years to come is to continue to build that relationship that helps our students bridge the gap. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Birke uh, and possibly Vanya too, who's, uh, who's you know, experienced some of this uh, perhaps, how are we accommodating intersectionality within our, our mental health education for the aviation program? Um, particularly as this is North Dakota and we're not the most diverse school on the planet. Great, thank you. That is a, a great question. And it is something that of course, we're all devoting a lot of time to the university just came out with their new, new diversity, uh, equity and inclusion task force uh, findings. Uh, we're taking those findings within our college now. We're starting to have those college-wide conversations on how do we address this? How do we either build it into the curriculum? How do we provide extracurricular activities? How do we address this? Because I'll be the first to say aviation is not diverse. You know, and I have felt that the last 25 years uh, in my career, but I think here at UND, we have a, a great community. I do want to give a shout out. We have some amazing student organizations organizations and I just want to encourage students to get involved with those they're kind of some of them are affinity groups so women in aviation national gay pilots association uh, this fall we just started the uh, organization of black aerospace professionals three amazing student groups that are devoted to this they've got a strong alumni network uh, I know a lot of these uh, events this year are virtual but it's made it very easy to zoom in uh, alumni within these areas to help mentor and talk through these these issues with our students so I, I can't encourage it enough I know we tell all of our students to get involved, but definitely if this is an area that uh, you need connections, you need help kind of wading through, please do reach out and join one of those student organizations. Amazing uh, network of support uh, is out there. But uh, one of the things I should address, uh, you know, we did uh, do a intersection course between uh, fall and uh, spring break on diversity in aviation. It was focused on uh, gender diversity, but there is uh, hope in the aviation department to expand that to a three credit class being offered this summer with uh, Alicia Looney. So if that's of interest to you, that is some curricular changes as well. Um, Dr. Christensen, there's a question here. What happens to people like myself who are going to graduate pretty soon? And we may not have, you know, the next three, four or five years of our life um, at UND. Are your resources still available to those who have graduated? What other, uh, uh, what other things can, can you provide? Can you provide references uh, if you speak on that? 
Uh, you bet. Yeah. Um, so great question. So like I alluded to earlier, uh, you can come back to UND Student Health as long as you like to get your flight physical done. Uh, we have, I've had, I think my oldest uh, patient uh, that came in for a flight physical was 88 years old and he was still getting his medical and he obviously wasn't a UND student, but um, he'd been coming back for years and years and years and years. So you are more than welcome to come back to get your medical done. Um, and if, uh, along with that, there's questions sometimes that arise. He had some medical issues. He would call periodically and say, what can I do for this and this and this? And so if you have any questions at any point, you can call and talk to either the nurse or they will get a hold of Dr. Heinle and myself. So um, you are more than welcome to come and, uh, and get your, your medical care for your flight physical as long as you'd like. And Dr. Solom, is that the same at the counseling center or is it uh, slightly different there? Yeah, so we talk on the other side. So unfortunately for us, we're covered under you know student fees as long as you're enrolled and taking classes. So we don't work with insurance. What we have do what we do do now is as students are uh, soon to graduate, we have a case manager embedded in our counseling center that we work with to try and make that transition as seamless as possible. Um, and, and we know that can be overwhelming sometimes in trying to find a provider that you want to work with uh, that you've been working with for a while. So that's our process that we have uh, given the, the, the infrastructure that we have set up for students covered under student fees. Paul, do you mind if I jump in for just a quick uh, uh, perspective as well? Um, as a graduate now working for Southwest Airlines, and I know I can say the same for Delta, American, SkyWest, many of the regionals, there, there are resources that continue that your employer will not know that you're having those conversations. Um, but it, it, it's such an e it made it an easier transition for me. Uh, to know that I had that resource. An example with Southwest right now um, with the pandemic is that they're, they're just saying, go give a call. They, they have telemedicine um, uh, and tele, uh, telemental help. Um, and so uh, the, those resources continue because your employer wants you the best of you, right? If no one wants to hire you if you're at 65%, right? But if they know that you are working to be greater and to be your best self, your employer is gonna want that as well. So um, an example with me is that I, I know I have five free mental health visits and then I can continue and get support with insurance and such, but what a great start. I might only need three um, or something like that just to, just to have the conversation, just to have the realization that I need. So those, those as a senior, the help doesn't end uh, as soon as you uh, you know throw your hat. It'll, it'll continue. People want you to be healthy. Thank you, Vanya. Um, Dr. Christensen, one more great question for you here. Um, uh, talking about preventative care, um, you know, I, I know a lot of times it feels like we have to wait until uh, things get really bad before we seek help because we don't want to risk our medical, um, uh, you know, especially with, I think, the fear that exists, um, you know, of the FAA. Can you talk about, you know, what, what is the process with preventative care, um, you know, both physical and, and mental? Yeah, that's a great, I was actually going to bring that up if I had a moment at the end here. Uh, again, to touch back on something that Vanya talked about, I used to give a lecture for the uh, med students when they started about um, taking care of yourself. And the fact that Vanya touched on, you know, when you get stressed, what happens? You don't sleep, you don't eat right, and you stop exercising in general. And those are the three things that you need to do to help maintain your mental health, your physical health, your, your just your well-being. So um, it's huge. It, it seems so basic. And sometimes it is basic. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you get your sleep, if you eat right, if you exercise do those things on a regular basis, I will guarantee you're going to feel better. You're going to be less likely to have the stuff we've been talking about. Um, but at times it happens. You, you, there can be a loss of a loved one. There can be some financial issues, things that happen, life happens. And, and those type of things we can deal with. And like I alluded to, if you need to come in and talk to someone, we work very closely with the counseling center. If you come in and talk to one of us or vice versa, we can get you set up with someone uh, to talk with about that. Oftentimes it is just a few sessions of working things out, having someone who's objective that can give you some feedback. 
you know, just reiterate those things you need to do on a daily basis to stay healthy. Um, and it can make a huge, huge, huge difference. Thanks. We, we, uh, we unfortunately are running uh, right up on our deadline here. We, we only have time for, um, I think, just a few more questions. Um, you know, one of the things I really wanted to end on was, was this, you know, from, from a sort of a bystander perspective, um, if I know somebody who's, who's really hurting, um, if I, you know, if I, if I see, uh, uh, somebody with, with that burden, um, what's the best thing to do? Who do I call and, and who do I, you know, where do I point that, that friend in that direction? Uh, I think we'll start with Dr. Solomon on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So probably what you're, you're doing already, you're not giving yourself credit is, is, is you're listening and, and, and not trying to fix, uh, um, in, in that context of, um, the trust of, of relationships is really about sometimes just, uh, listening and, and trying to understand, um, what they're sharing. And then when it, it sort of moves into that, um, professional resource, um, we recognize that sometimes, bringing that up, particularly when uh, people are already have a trust uh, connection, they're, 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 they're appreciative. They, they, they um, want to give someone a hug because they've been carrying something for a while. So just opening that up can really have a powerful dynamic. And then when we look at, at, tr at professional support of just even showing up for something like this and talking about the things that are available, making it um, an, an experience that is, is, um, uh, positive and not negative, right? And look through a, a source of, of strength to take care of cell, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally. So then um, when we talk about our services, we have same day sessions. We have, um, um, we have an Ask Me program that we have uh, developed this year. It's uh, uh, where people can just call anonymously and um, it's not open all the time. Uh, I'd have to look at the webpage for the exact time and date again this semester. Um, but it, it allows people to call in if they, they've had the conversation, they wanted to just ask about questions about counseling and they've never had it before. It can be a very powerful conversation. We have case management where again, they can ask further questions with a licensed person. And then of course our, our, our services, whether it be online or calling. So I think it's, it's that continuum of, of knowing and, and, and listening and not having to fix and knowing your professional support. It's the same way when I get into a conversation, when I know it's leaning over into Dr. Christensen, I reach out to Dr. Christensen and again, make sure that someone knows we have a team. And I think friends look for the same thing. Know that you don't have to do it alone. You have a team of support at UND uh, administration, uh, Dr. Bierke, Ryan, like all of, all of the people here, I think can further that. And the more that you know how to navigate that, the easier it, it, it'll be having that conversation. Thank you so much. That's all the questions we have time for, unfortunately. Um, if you do have any of those, you know, specific concerns, specific fears, um, definitely, you know, you can call Dr. Christensen. We'll, we'll put his number uh, for student health in the chat. Uh, um, call UCC. Um, I am going to toss it over to Brian Willis now for some closing thoughts. Sorry, I think I'll just add, you can call me too. If you have any questions, let me know. If you need any clarifications, call me anytime as well. So I don't just want to call the center as well. So sorry about that. Oh, you're, you're good, Dr. Solomon. And again, I, I just want to A, thank all the panelists um, from, from Vanya to Paul to Dr. Christensen, Dr. Solom, um, Dr. Birke for, for putting this together uh, to kind of close out Aviation Safety Week. When, when we talk about aviation safety, as, as Vanya knows, a lot of times we're talking about pitch, airspeed, stalling an airplane, running a checklist, and, and everything is, is what we're doing in that cockpit. And sometimes what you have to do as a person is step back because what's here um, and, and what you take care of yourself is more important than that switch, the throttle lever, the control wheel, control wheel or you name it in the airplane. And so this is, is hopefully... Um, just a springboard, I, I want to say, for, for UND Aerospace as we continue uh, to talk about mental health, as we can continue to talk about ways that we can become better organizationally, better individually, um, which I think when then you look at the big picture, as, as someone mentioned, 
20 years from now, a lot of the students that are going through the program are to be out at the industry. And the more people that we have awareness within this, um, you know, mental health topic, I think the better off, not just you in the aerospace is, I think the industry becomes. And that's really the ultimate goal uh, here. And, 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 as, and as, as a second push, I know it's been talked about a lot. The other part of this was to open up a conversation, a portal uh, to put the face to the name. So if you have questions, if you have concerns, or you know of somebody that you're concerned about, don't be afraid uh, to, to reach out. I know that sounds cliche, um, maybe you've seen it on a commercial or a radio infomercial somewhere or a, a website, but this isn't that. Uh, again, we're talking about Dr. Solom, who's right down the road on University Avenue, Dr. Christensen, who's, you know, five buildings away, and then, and then myself out at the airport and, and Beth over at Odegaard. So uh, that's, that's really the, the truth here is opening up that conversation. And again, it's great to have alum come back because it's another resource if, if we had to reach out. I'm sure Vanya would be more than willing to, to have that conversation as, as he was excited to come here today. So that's the power of that's the power of the human spirit, I think. And that's the power of these types of conversations. So with that, thank you all for attending. Thank you for the questions. And again, thanks for the panelists.